Hello, my name's Stephen Frosty. It's F R O S T I, like the snowman. Sometimes I'm called Wind Rider. If you look at the website windridercreations.com, there'll be a wealth of information on there. I've chosen to do this in this format on how to build uh, an aquarium filter this way because the whole point of this program is how anyone can do it in any easy given situation at home. It's not with fancy equipment with the bells and whistles and having a big shop or anything. I'm literally doing this in a back bedroom, indoors. It can be done in a garage, anywhere. It doesn't take much. I got tables here that were built for $50 in wood. You could use a fold-out table. But that's why I'm doing it in this format. You know, I'm wearing the clothes that I would usually wear. I'm doing it in just a back bedroom using just a few dollars of hand tools. So it's going to be done just that way. You'll see it step by step. I'm not going to be editing things out or changing things. And uh, you'll see exactly the way it can be done in a professional way, you know, where you get professional quality product, but very inexpensively in any home shop. So as uh, I go through everything, I may take a little brief moments explain a little bit about the tools I'm using or the jigs, some of your options. Uh, there's two other parts to this. This part is about building a unit and I was going to build two different units, one with baffles and one without, which would be a plain sum, but instead I'm going to just build this one unit. It'll be as a refugium with three baffles, but as we're building it, I'll be explaining how you don't have to add the baffles and it can just be a sump, you know, a square box that holds water in essence, okay? Uh, the second part will be on how to finish it, how to finish it without professional equipment in a place. Matter of fact, we're going to go outside and we're going to route it, trim flush route the edges. And I'm even going to do it in the snow in the winter of Cleveland, literally in the snow. I'm just going to route it very quickly, bring it in, clean it up, and polish the edges with a, a, a matte flame as opposed to hydrogen gas flame, which is pretty expensive to set up. It's not worth doing in the home shop. Uh, the matte gas is very inexpensive, and I'll talk about that later on the uh, second uh, disc. There's also uh, been recorded a little question and answer session pretty goofy the way it was done you know I just sat down and I was being asked a bunch of questions I probably covered just about every question you might have uh, please feel free to email me at any time if you uh, have any questions okay beyond what you see here uh, there'll be times that we'll uh, shut off the camera and bring it very close for details so that you can actually see the actual detail being filmed this is a companion, this video, with uh, approximately a 100 page book, which goes through it step by step in details, uh, describing it in words with pictures. You may notice it's a different filter, but it's built exactly the same, where we actually took the, a picture step by step as we were building other filters, and there's actually pictures in there. Uh, hopefully with this video actually showing the process and the book, anyone will be able to replicate this, okay? So let's uh, start. The first thing we're going to do is a good all-around size that we like is 30 inches long by 15 by 15 high. Uh, it's a good all-around sump. Uh, something that size could probably be used for about a 100-gallon aquarium. Generally, we build them in even denominations like 24, 30, and 36. Uh, our heights are always 15 inches. Good yield for a 4 by 8 sheet. And we, we usually fluctuate the depth. You know, we have 9 inch, 12 inch, and 15 inch to offer. Uh, this here being the 15 inch uh, gives it a lot more sump volume still can fit under most cabinets except for you know thin cabinets but 
the parts themselves, you might ask, you know, how are you cutting the parts in the, in the back bedroom? No, they're not. Uh, but it can be done with a hundred dollar craftsman's little table saw as long as you get an appropriate plastic blade and that's been explained more in the booklet. Uh, for your first time you might want to actually go to a plastic company and you give them a cut list and you tell them you want the edges finished on a joiner. Uh, it might cost you a bit more. We also supply kits if you're only building one where you can actually order from us a 30 by 15 by 15 kit that includes all the parts array jointed ready for you to build. It's a way to save a good bit of money. If you're going to build a few of them, some for friends, maybe you're in an aquarium club, you might want to, you know, go in together and, you know, go to a plastic company, buy a couple of sheets worth, have it all cut up, or you can then cut it up yourself. It, you know, even an inexpensive $20 plastic or laminate blade at Home Depot will work if you're just cutting a little bit. Uh, but for here we've already had this cut, the pieces are in front of me, the edges are jointed. As I said, all that's explained in the written work uh, in detail. And uh, But we'll start having our parts right here and I'm going to explain to you the parts in a moment. These four parts here are the baffles. They've all been, uh, you know, we join them together to make sure the exact same height. Can we see this? Oh, and by the way, I have uh, Jeremy, my son's doing the filming. But we'll put the baffles right here. There's four of them. Now, I did say it's a three baffle, four chamber unit. But one of our baffles is made up of two baffles to allow a, a gap, an area for water to go through. And you'll see that later as we're building it. In the book, there's actually the cut list, how to calculate what you're cutting, etc. Plus plenty of pictures to see what your end product would be. We have two sides, which, by the way, obviously are the same width as the baffles. We have our front and back. We also have our bottom that I've kept down here. We use that last, but. And we have uh, two pieces that we use as stiffeners for framework. When we build a, a refugium where we have the baffles, we're adding a lot more strength to it. So we only use a brace in the front and back. We leave the sides open. That way if you have to hang something, you have more clearance. You don't really need it since you're adding so much strength with the baffles. If you choose not to put the baffles in and it's a square box, I recommend framework on the sides also, which is explained also in the book. You can always email me with questions, etc. Everything's pre-cut, pre-jointed. To start our project, I try to stay pretty organized. I'll take the back. I'll put it down here. And I always start out with the front, okay? I lay the front down in front of me. First thing I do is I peel my paper, put it in a garbage can or what have you, okay? Now generally, I clean everything as I go with glass cleaner. I'll show you that in a minute. If you don't clean it with glass cleaner, and do not use glass cleaner like Windex, okay? Let, let me show you the type that you would actually use, and I'll be right back with that. Okay, I went and got some glass cleaner, some paper towel. I prefer to use bounty paper towel. It's softer, just a good precaution. I use a type of glass cleaner that is safe for plastic. It will say right on the container, which I don't expect you to be able to read this, but it says contains no ammonia, safe for plastic. You don't want to use anything that's ammonia or strong alcohol. 
You can go to Home Depot and just ask for cleaner, it's safe for plastic. It's generally available. As long as it says on it though that it's safe for plastic, it's good. Okay? And what I do is I just spray real quick my parts. As I said, the importance of it is if you have dust on these when you glue them, those dust particles can actually look like spots in the seam. Okay? And we don't need that. So I take my towel. Give it a good quick cleaning. Okay. Clean my framework. Now, I do this by eye. But what happens is the framework, which in a moment I'll show you the details, but let me explain a little farther. I estimate approximately a quarter inch gap on the top maybe a bit under. I also want to make sure there's enough room on the left and right side for my size of this. This is actually what I'm geared, you know, gears my dimensions. If I want this unit to be 30 inches and I know my two sides are quarter, I would cut this at 29 and a half. Now in this particular case we're using 3 16th material. These have been cut at 29 and a quarter plus the 316s and 316s will actually allow this filter to be 29 and 5 8 inch. It's easy for the cut. We cut everything at 30 and that allows a little extra on the sides to route it, which you'll see later. And you'll understand later when we see it. Now, I'm going to lay this down with some weights. And in a moment, we'll bring it closer and you can see the details. And, uh, but what I do is I add two to three weights and I actually estimate it being square up and down by sight. If you have trouble with that, you can always use a small square. Uh, these squares come in handy, but they allow you to actually see if it's square. Okay, what I'm going to do now is set this up so that you can watch me do this with a little more detail. So let me show you some detail. Okay, now, we got a little more detailed shot here so you can actually wa wa watch me put the frame on. I'm using these metal bars. You know, we talked about weights with questions. You can use bricks that we cover in tape. Even, uh, you know, your favorite tape. <laughs> Not to say much. You know, this is masking tape. And, but any type of tape to help protect it, you can use different size bricks. They come in all sizes. Metal weights. That's something that, you know, you'll see where you're at. The bricks cost 35 cents a piece at any, uh, even at a Home Depot, and you can wrap them in tape. But I'm choosing to use these metal bars because I had them. Now, if you watch carefully here, and I'm sure he'll come in real close, you'll find I left enough room here to actually glue the side on with a little overhang. I'm approximately a quarter inch space, and by shaking this back and forth I can feel that it's square this is a 90 degree angle I put my first brick then I move to the center with a little space and I put another brick or weight and then down here now before I glue it I check I make sure there's enough space here for my side plus a little extra overhang enough space here for my side and I make sure the spacing in the front here is equal. Now, as I said, I do it by eye. To be honest, if it's not slightly off, it really doesn't matter. If you want to be a little more particular and you don't trust your eye, use your square. You can actually check with your square to see if this is 90 degrees. You can measure the distance. Now, these are pretty much common sense things. Obviously, if you're building this, you have some sense of use of tools. Okay, but you do want this pretty square. Now, at this point, we uh, let me find my uh, little bot solvent bottle. While I have you here in close detail, I'll explain a few things about this bottle, even though it's been explained. We use the Craftix two ounce bottles, which is what we prefer to use. We use a needle. Uh, 
This looks about a 20 gauge needle. And if you can look on the cardboard, you can see about how fast it dispenses. One of the most important things with gluing is learning how to control the flow of your solvent. If not, it will just drip everywhere. Okay? I'm going to glue this real quick just so it has a chance to dry and then I can spend a couple of minutes explaining to you the process of learning how to glue with this. I recommend that you get some scrap plastic and practice gluing before you do something like this, especially if you want a very high quality seam. Okay? Right now we're not going to use needles or any of the techniques that I'm going to explain further for the sides and bottom because it's not as important for the framework. For this, I'm going to simply glue along here. Now remember, we're using a solvent. Pushing like this is another little thing that helps. If you push as you glue, it allows more solvent to go under. If you look carefully, I didn't get any bubbles in the seams. But I was doing that to let it dry. Let's explain a little more about this bottle. Okay, Jeremy will show you. I tend to curve my needle, and I take the tip and I unblunt it by running a little sandpaper over it. That way it won't, you know, cut me. A couple of little hints. Now let's talk a little bit about how to glue. The first thing I do before I glue is number one I never fill the bottle all the way to the top. I leave at least a fourth to a third empty to give me a little air. What I do is I push most of the air out of the needle and by doing that it pushes any excess solvent out of the needle. Okay. Now watch carefully. As I turn it over the glue or solvent starts to pour out and then I loosen my grip on the bottle about a couple inches before the end of my gluing and that draws in the solvent back in. By doing this there's no more drip. Let me show you. I tip it and I start gluing. Now watch as I let go notice how it stopped. No drip. Now watch if I don't do that watch what happens. I'm gluing. Oh shoot, I want to stop, but see, it, it kept dripping right there at the end because I had no control. So the first thing I do is I blow the air out, tip it, start gluing into the seam. I let go gently and see, no dripping. Okay? Practice that with some scrap. You'll always use that technique when you're gluing. A couple other little things that you might want to notice is that. Look at the angle of the bottle. I tend to glue with the bottle up on angle like this so that it flows into the seam. If you glue along it like this, you can actually blow it through the seam onto your project. Especially when we start using needles where there's actually a gap. So please, you know, review some of the information in the book, rewind and look at this again, but practice gluing a few seams. Okay? Uh, with some scrap. Generally they'll give you a little scrap in any plastic house and uh, before you attempt any major project like this. Okay? We're done with the details. Hello, we're back. <laughs> I gave uh, this front support bar about a 15 minute uh, you know, period to uh, get uh, hard enough to work with. Just to let you know, I'm using Weldon 3. Uh, if you Weldon uh, products, the uh, solvents, if you look in the book, it'll show you resources where to get it, etc. 3 uh, dries a lot quicker, dries strong, especially if you use the needle technique we use. 4 would be used if you're in a human environment, which you don't generally get you know, in a house or something. If it's real humid, you might get this white hazing called blushing, and the four slows down the drying process a little bit to reduce blushing. Believe it or not, most acrylics will work better with the three, okay, unless you're buying very high-end uh, domestic cast uh, acrylics like polycast or something, where you would mix it more with four, but I want to recommend the additional cost for filters or sumps. And those are used for larger aquariums. Let's get back to our project here. Right now where we're at is we have the front support bar 
uh, solvent and cement it to the front of our filter. We take our weights off. As I said, it's been about 15 minutes. My son ordered his pizza. It'll be here soon. And I gotta get the kids something for filming this. <laughs> the next step is to put the sides on. Generally, if I'm building a refugium, when I put the sides on, I also put the baffles on. And the reason being is number one, whenever we glue something on here, we want to add some weight, some pressure to it. And it's actually easier to put weights when you have a piece nearby that you can lay it on. And you'll see that in a minute. If you're not using the baffles, you still need a, a way to put the weight on. And I'll show you some options there also. The next step though to consider, the very important step of building this, is the jigs. Uh, fixtures for keeping the sides and baffles 90 degrees to your work. Being that I do more than one, and I've been doing it for 23 years, we use these fixtures, uh, maybe Jeremy can show you close up. I'm not expecting you to go build these, but I'll tell you something, if you're going to build a handful of them for your friends, sell a few around the neighborhood, whatever, you might want to consider building some type of jig. It can be done with scrap. Generally, if you can see this, it's a four-sided box. What I did though, instead of putting the sides to the end and in, I did that so I can clamp it. That's all I did. There's no set rule or anything like that. The only thing you'll notice is that there's blocks on the bottom. And the reason for the blocks is to keep it a gap so that when we glue the sides, the solvent doesn't seep onto the jig. The blocks are very important. It doesn't have to be glued on blocks either. You can take a piece of wood or acrylic Say you have a box, lay a block down and then put it on that block, okay? And that keeps it up as long as it's square and 90 degrees. When we send a kit, we include these little squaring jigs right here with the kits. That's another good reason for actually wanting to purchase a kit from us. All they are is a little piece and what that does is it allows you to square it up you just hold it there it's a little more difficult to work with than something like a box jig but it works you actually can use your squares that's why I like these kind of squares that stand up I have two of them I can actually stand these up and as long as they're not touching the ground see there's a little space under here the glue won't seep in. Many ways, okay? Uh, you can actually, you know, stick these with double side tape to a large piece. Many ways to do it. Uh, of course, if you're building more than a few, a box jig like this is wonderful. I go one step further. The distance of these jigs is the distance between my baffles. So this is a little bit more for production. It's designed that way. And you're going to see that in a minute. Without a jig like this, you will have to lay your baffles in there and actually measure them with a tape measure. I don't need to do that here. But either way, it'll work fine. It'll just take you a few extra minutes using a tape measure. This way you can customize it. You know, if you need your return area a little larger for a bigger pump, or your input area a little bigger for a bigger skimmer, you just move it over. All this is explained in the booklet, but let's start and go through the process. You'll understand a little better as we go through. What I start to do for this, my return chamber, the chamber where the pump pumps back to the chamber is six inches, generally. That fits most pumps, even two pumps. I use my six inch jig. I place it here. Now my input section where I have a skimmer, and oh, by the way, I keep my clamps in there. I keep some shims, which I can explain to you the use as needed for them later. All they are is little broken pieces of Formica. 
But you can use a lot of different things for shims. You can buy shims at Home Depot. But these little pieces are for mica. And generally they're not needed much. Maybe a little bit when you're gluing the bottom out. And that will be explained as we go. And I use sometimes cardboard shims. But generally you don't need them much with a small project like this. But I still keep them inside my jig. Another good reason I have the jig. This is an 8 inch jig. And the beauty of that is, is that my input chamber is 8 inches on a filter this size. Okay, so we can do it all at once. As I said, it's not necessary to do it. Uh, I'm uh, considering uh, also having some little prints on uh, jigs if you're interested in building your own jigs. But you can just email me anything you like and I'll help you with it. But anything that will keep it square. I laid my jigs on there. The next thing I do is I take one of my side pieces. Peel the paper, of course. It's nice to have this film, too. It easily removes. Put it in my garbage can. Now, as I had said, especially the edges, I clean with a little glass cleaner. Get the dust off. And I put it against the jig. Now I have to make sure which side. If you see here, this is backwards. The space here. I flip it, and now this distance of this side is equal to the height of the front and back. Okay? It's important if we put it on right. Set my jig in the middle, and I take my little hand clamps. These are on special at Home Depot quite often for like 99 cents, the spring clamps. I put one on one side, making sure I'm pushing down as I do it. Another on the other side. And what I do is I get this situated just right. Okay. What I'm going to do now is we're going to get a little close up going. So let me show you some detail. How you doing? Uh, we, uh, I'm getting in a little closer in the details so you can see. What I want to do is I do this by eye. Generally, it, there's an overhang and I want it to be pretty much equal, top and bottom. In this case, it's about 3 16ths of an inch. If you want, you can use a ruler. But I do it by eye to make sure it's pretty much parallel, perpendicular. What's important is where my finger is right here, that this is equal. If it is not equal, Remember, this is the bottom. When we turn this to glue the bottom, if this is not flush, equal here, you will not be able to solve and cement this in a high quality professional manner. It's very important. It's gonna maybe slide a little. So even after you solve and cement it, the first minute you have to keep checking this with your finger and make sure it hasn't slid on you. Very important. If this ends up way off, you almost have to scrap the unit. Okay. You make sure it's pushed up against the framework here. It's in good position. When it's in a position that's good, we're gonna insert our needles. For the sides and the bottom, we're gonna use a needle technique which makes the seam much stronger, clear, last for a long time without any issues. And the way we do that is we insert these needles. Now here I'm using about a 20 gauge needle, the same needle I dispensed solvent with. Two will be fine. And I insert the needle in the seam just to say a quarter inch. And I hope you can see this on here. But if you look, the needle's just in the seam. What this does is it allows a slight gap, which allows me to apply more solvent. It lets the solvent melt the acrylic more so that when I pull these needles one to two minutes later, depending on temperature, we'll talk about that a little more in a minute, it will actually sink down. It will make a seam so strong that once it's dried, say 24 hours, if you try to rip it apart, you will break the acrylic before you do the seam. Okay, let's double check everything. About the same amount of spacing here. Flush. Needle is in only about a quarter inch at the most. Tight. Okay, and now we're ready to apply solvent. We have our bottle. 
One other little thing I like to mention is that if your table isn't totally flat, and we'll go over a little point here, but you'll probably notice I have cardboard on the table. The reason for this is the cardboard has some give. So if the table isn't perfectly level, that's where the shims come in, okay? We may find there's a slight dip right here, and as I apply solvent, you'll notice it's taking a lot more in the middle. If so, stop and just slide the shim in a little bit right under the bottom piece, right under the front there, and that will raise up just a little bit. We may not need it. Let's find out. First thing I do, as I said, is I vacuum the air out. Now, if you'll notice, I start applying solvent, not on the edge, but I do it about an inch in so that we don't have much running off. Watch. Very carefully. I just let it drip out, really. I'm not pushing. See how it's flowing into the seam? As it flows in the seam, you can see the color change in the seam. See that? After you've practiced a few, you'll understand what I'm saying, but if there were any bubbles in the seam, they would look darker, with more black. Now, I double check here that it's flush it is I make sure I have glue all in the seam and if you notice let's go over this again I held down an angle like this if I held it like this I could have blown through it that's what I was meaning when I was talking about that before the temperature in the room here you know this is winter out here in Cleveland is about 55 degrees 60 in this room I don't keep it that warm at this temperature, we're going to let this sit about a minute and a half. If it was in the 75 range, you'd let it sit maybe 30 seconds. If it was in the 50 range, probably two minutes. But what you're looking for is that when you pull the needle, the, I call it a fillet, the extra solvent that comes out from both sides is thicker. It's like it sinks in. If it's very watery, meaning I pull it and it just like liquid water just goes down, it hasn't melted the acrylic enough and it still needs a little more longer to sit. If you pull the needle and it barely moves like it's almost gummed up real thick, you've left the needles in too long. Little practice, that's why you practice with scrap even needling will help you. Okay, it's been now about a minute, minute and a half. We're going to try the first needle. I gently pull it out and if you look it sank in there now it moved a little that's why it says you check it you have about a minute to move it see how I can push it slightly now I pull the other needle see how it sinks in you'll see a fillet there sometimes I even add a little more solvent in that fillet won't hurt it but now the most important part before it dries too much is to make sure that bottom is flush. I keep checking it with my finger. It's perfectly flush. The corner's here. I make sure it's square. Okay? Now, before he gets away from the detail, I want to show you, at this point, you need a way to add weight. If I wasn't putting any baffles in and this was a sump, okay, I would take the other side Clamp it to the other side of my jig like this. And just add a brick or two. Just to add some weight. Okay? Let's talk about this for a few minutes. We don't need the details any. Okay, let's discuss this a little more. Let's assume we're building just a sump, no baffles. You have the left side on. What I did was I just clamped the other side to the other side of the jig, no solvent, to allow a rest area for my weight. These bricks, by the way, are five pounds each. I have 10 pounds on here. That helps keep it synced. You notice I keep putting my finger here. I'm checking to make sure it's flush and not sliding. Within two, three minutes, it's not gonna slide anymore. You probably want about a half an hour before you actually flip it though. And a couple hours before you actually route it. And overnight before you would actually flame polish it. And overnight for it to reach at least 96, 7, 8% of its full strength, okay? 
Another note, if this was not being built as a sump, I'm adding my baffles. The baffle that goes here would then be glued in place here, right now. And I'm gonna do that in a minute, instead of this side. And then you could add your weight to this. Okay, so, just to review, I, I don't want you to miss this point, because in a way, at this point, we can either build a sump or a refugium. Is, if it's a sump, I use this as a side, and I put the weight on. Now, what you can also do is take this side, glue it onto this side, exact same procedure. Get yourself a 2x4, a long piece of wood, greater than 30 inches, say 36 inches. Here's a long piece of acrylic. Lay it across and add a weight to both sides. That's what I would usually do if this was going to be a sump. I would immediately glue this side onto here in the exact same procedure, <coughs> lay a piece of wood or anything long that allows me to sit a brick on each side. If I hope that clarifies enough for a sump building. We're not building a sump here, we're building a refugium. So let's backtrack. And what we're going to do is I'm taking this off because I'm building a refugium. I don't need it. What I would do is I just glued my side. This is the side of the return, six inches. My jig is six inches. I take the baffle that goes there. And you can look at the placement of the baffle and why. I don't need to go in great detail, but if you look at the pictures of the finished unit, you know, you can understand the water flow and why. And by the way, there's many, many configurations. You can take these techniques, move your baffles, bigger, smaller, move them. You can use, I've seen configurations with six or seven baffles. Use the same, you know, techniques. This baffle gets put in here on the other side. Thanks for the reminder. I just reminded myself, why don't we clean it? If not, I have some dust particles. Less apt for the seam to be clear. Mainly the edges is what's important. I place this here. This baffle has to allow water to flow under it, so there's a big gap on the bottom. Remember, this is the bottom. The framework's the top. I take my uh, clamps, clamp, spring clamp, and clamp. Now, obviously, this would be the same height because this is the back. If it isn't, you better check that you didn't grab the wrong piece. Now, you're going to notice something here, and in a minute, we're going to check details, but. I, after gluing this, number one, I'm not going to use needles. The inside, the seams don't need to be as, you know, good. Why bother using needles, etc.? You can, but it's not necessary, especially if you want to get it built, because there's nothing going to the outside. It's all within the filter. As soon as I'm done gluing this, I will then add my weights here. Now, this is an important point. Don't add the weight until you're done gluing it. The reason being, it will be tighter and less apt to get as much solvent. In a minute, I'm going to show you the details of gluing this, how I push as I go. With the weight, it won't work as well. I won't be able to get as much solvent under there. So that's an important point. You add the weight after you glue it. Now, we're going to go for a detail in a second. I'm going to show you gluing this, and then we'll put the weight. So let me show you the detail. Okay, just to show you the details here. First thing is blow extra solvent out of the needle. If you don't, this is where you're going to drip it everywhere. Hopefully you've practiced, you don't drip. If you do, you can always lay a little piece of paper towel right here, catch your drip, whatever you need to do. You're going to watch that as I glue, I'm pushing down. And what that does, I'm gently pushing to allow more solvent to get under it. You don't really need to do that for this thickness, but it does help get more solvent under. So let's watch. See how I push as I go? I covered there with solvent. The next thing I do right away is I get a brick over this. 
I'll even put two just for good measure. Okay, we're done with that detail. Okay, real good. We have the one baffle in on this side. We have our weights helping to push down on now the baffle on the side. We do add another baffle here, but I don't do that right away, as you'll, you'll see in a minute why. The next thing I do is I go to the input side, put the side on, and it's set of baffles. Now, if you're not using this style of jig, and this jigs aren't set to the right width, you don't necessarily need to do it in this order, especially with a filter this big. You can just put this side on using your squares, put this side on using your squares, start from either way and do your baffles one after the other. It takes a little longer because you're going to want to put in one baffle, wait 15, 20 to 30 minutes, come back and put another baffle. But you're not under such time constraints if they're not being commercially manufactured. So let's put our other side on. Just a little note here, when I put the side on here, I'm only going to be able to clamp from this side. These are the jigs that I've always had. In essence, it would have been better if this jig was longer, but it isn't, and I never bothered building a jig to accommodate this because I, you know, it works fine for me and I never needed to. But the next step is to peel the side. Remember, an important concept, never glue with any of the paper on the plastic. You'll end up gluing the plastic on and everything. Jeremy's making some weird motions there. I don't know why. Maybe he's trying to say the pizza's here. He's hungry. Actually, this works out great since I'm going to have to let it sit for about 15, 20 minutes. Is it here? Uh, did give us time while chowing to uh, let it dry. Here's the other side, clean, ready to go. Follow the same rule. Make sure it's the right way. See how it's equal on the top and bottom? Put your spring clamp on this side. Make sure it's flush. What I'm going to do, just as a review, the more times you see it the better, is we're going to go into detail mode now. Okay, this is a review. We're doing the exact same thing we're doing on this side. It's just I want to do it again and show you again because this is a hard concept to put in written words and I want to make sure you get this. This is pretty much a basic technique for all your gluing. You know, with this you could build a lot of other projects out of plastic. So we add the needles. I slightly lift and slide that needle under. Double check everything. Top and bottom equal, especially the bottom, flush. The top isn't perfectly equal, it really doesn't matter. The distance here, here, and here are equal, at least by eye. Okay. You need to make sure your needles are in tight. Remember how I keep a shim here in case I have to slide one under? Sometimes I do. And we get our bottle. Like always, I blow the excess air out. See how I push and I blow the extra solvent out. And then I start gluing, make sure the seam's clean, about an inch. Not right here, because it'll end up going up and around and you'll scar your material. About right here. And you'll see it flow, which you should get comfortable with this doing scrap before you start this anyway. So. See how I stopped about an inch before? I let the air out and it kept it from dripping. Now, we're going to wait about a minute and a half and uh, we're going to pull the needles. While I have this minute, I'll explain to you real quick what we're going to do next is, like any option here, I could just put a piece here and let the side dry. If I was building a sump, that's what I would do. Or, if I didn't have jigs that had the proper spacing, I would do that. But, what we're going to do is put in the next set of baffles immediately, okay? Before we do that, though, we have to pull the needles. 
okay and uh, do it so let's take a break for a minute and let this dry for about another minute before pulling the needles and then we'll discuss the details okay so that's enough for those details well that was a pizza guy we just took a little break in between you and, my, and me the wings sucked <laughs> Almost gonna give me a stomach ache. Uh, we just glued this side and I pulled the needles and I double checked. It was flush down here. What we're gonna do is add the next two baffles. The two baffles are gonna go in a straight line right here. Okay, as the more detail comes in. But we're gonna put a small one here, a space, and then a bigger one. And I'm gonna use a couple of bars for support. The first one has got to be even with the bottom. If it sticks out, you'll have trouble putting the bottom on. That's very important. If anything, have come in slightly, but have not go this way. If not, you'll have to file it and it's a mess. I take my small unit. And by the way, <clears throat> even though this was probably explained prior, the reason this is done this way is so that you can put a sand bed in the refugium area here. That way you can put, say, sand up to about three inches. I clean my unit and then we put a clamp on. I make sure that it's flush on the bottom here. And this is on good, it touches the whole front. Okay. And in this case I put this on here just to help support it, but I do not put the weight on yet. Okay. Now let me put on the second baffle. Peel it, clean it, this because of the way my jig is I can't clamp it so I hold it here and this little bar will hold it in place. If you notice I left about an inch and a half gap here almost two inches so as the water goes in, it will actually go through here. And then it's going to actually rise over a wall and go down. You'll see that in a minute. But double check here that it's flush. Okay, gap, straight line. So where we glue. Pressure out air and extra solvent. Gently start an inch away. End an inch away. Pressure again. Vacuum it, it's called. Add glue there, add glue here. Now I add the weights. I add a weight here to put pressure, and a weight here to put pressure. Now remember, if you do not have a jig like this, you may actually have to sit there with your little square, put your piece there, measure the distance. This is eight inches. You have to do this one and this one separately. So is how you want to go about doing this but in this case we were able to do both at once I have my weights on what I'm gonna do now <clears throat> is do my last baffle here and you watch you'll be able to see that come on over here I take off this clamp this is on my bubble trap and it happens to be an inch and a half to fit bubble bio balls so what I do is I just lay my square here and I have an inch and a half Many ways you can do this. You can put an inch and a half piece of wood in there. You can measure it. You can put a jig here. But this works good for me. What I do is I take my last baffle, peel and clean. Like I've done before. What I do here is I have a second square, help me square it, and I have me a weight, my metal weight. You can use anything. I push it against the square, hold it square up and down to what I can tell by my eye, and lay my weight down. And then using this, I look and see if it's square. Well, it's off square, isn't it? So I lift up and move it until it's square. 
as I said, you could use do this many ways with different jigs, but it's pretty easy just to use little squares like this. Make sure it's even with the bottom. And then I turn this and slowly pull it out. Now I check how it's flush on the bottom here. Remember how it was flush over here? It's flush here. The water enters here and then has to rise, go up, go back down. You can put bio balls here. Okay, and then they go around. <clears throat> I have the weight array on it. In this case, you have a weight on it that makes it easier so it doesn't fly. If I didn't want to, I could put another jig here. It'd be hard to glue this way, but this works fine. You can apply solvent quickly and then push. Okay, many ways to do it. Same thing here, when I applied solvent, instead of pushing as you go, you could apply it quickly and then push. As long as you do it quickly, okay? I'm double checking now. Okay, a quick recap. I'll keep this in for detail. I put on one side, using any type of jig. If it's just a sump, I add the next side and I put a long bar with weight on it right away. If not, I usually add baffles with my side and use my weight. Okay? Here I have an 8 inch. Here I had a 6 inch for return. This is the top. This is the bottom. What's important at this point is that all four points, where the side meets the bottom, where this baffle meets the bottom, where this baffle meets the bottom, and where this side meets the bottom are all flush. No gaps. That's important. Okay, uh, the only thing that might be a little different for you is the type of jigs you use. You may have to not have the luxury of being able to put the baffle on side at the same time and weight both of them. You may have to just do one at a time, use your piece of wood going across to lay to individual weight, have to wait 15, 20 minutes between each one. But this is a quick way. This is a point where we have to give it some time to rest, even as much as a half an hour. Now, in the meantime, the next step is to get your back with another support bar. That's the next step. There's many different ways of doing it. Let's talk about it in a minute. Uh, let's get off detail. Okay, it hasn't been 30 minutes yet, but there's a few things I want to make note of. If you are not limited in space and you have an extra table, like I do here on the other side, I can prepare the back. When I am limited in space, I wait 30 minutes, I take off all my bricks, all my bars, I take out my jigs, my clamps, and what I do is I slide my bottom underneath, or not my bottom, but my back under my front. I slide the unit back and I actually glue the bar on right here. What makes that take a little longer though is that <clears throat> I can't do that until this is all dry. Then I have to wait another 10 minutes before, which would be the next step, I flip the whole unit upside down onto its back. And then you can guess, obviously, from there you glue all the sides and baffles in. To save a little time, I'm going to glue the support bar onto the back on the other side of the table here. Okay? So we're going to go a little bit in detail mode since my back will be facing you and see from the side. Even though it's identical to what we did, the first steps, I'd just like you to see it again so that you... Uh, you know, get a little better understanding this time around. Okay, let's go into detail mode. Okay, I'm back from the long journey around the table, about three seconds. Okay, what I'm going to do here is get my back. Right here. Peel one side. We don't want to peel the side, obviously, facing outside, you can still have to route. 
less scratches that way. Want to do a good cleaning. This is identical to what we did before. The more time you see it though, the more you're apt to understand it. Here's our other support bar. And nice to have a nice little garbage can too. Or you can use uh, the method my kids use, throw it on the floor. We lay our bar there. We're going to do this pretty much by sight, by eye. The important is that we have space on both sides. Here, you might want to come and zoom in here. We hold it square, about a quarter inch in the front, enough on the side for the side. We use our weight. We do the same for the middle. We do the same on the end. And if you want to check it, here's your square. Square there. Square there. Double check. Is there enough room on the side here to glue it? The side with overhang? Yes. On this side? Yes. Is the space in the front equal relatively to my side and about equal to the other side? It is. Let's glue it. I'm going to use the same method, glue it, and then I can push right after. First thing, vacuum out the bottle. Start applying solvent. Make sure there's no bubbles. If you see it having trouble flowing under, you can just push it immediately. Especially where the weights are. Very good. Now, like doing the front, this takes 10 15 minutes. But at the same time, we have another 10 15 minutes from the front there. Okay. Uh, okay, we're done with the details here. A quick recap before we take our break. I had just glued the support bar on the back piece. We're letting that dry. Here we got our sides and our actually three baffles. I know it was four pieces, but I count this as one baffle. Your uh, baffle here is your refugium area. I'm gonna let this dry about 15, 20 minutes, and when we come back, we're actually gonna flip the unit. Now what I'm gonna do is take the back, bring it over here, and flip the unit. And then after that, we'll go into the details of how to uh, glue the sides and baffles on the flipped unit. And then once they're all glued, all we got is the bottom. Glue the bottom on, let it set for a few hours, and then the trim flush routing and polishing would be the next step. And you're ready for a filter, a do-it-yourself filter. Obviously at that point you have to add the pumps, the lights, etc. But you will have a filter built with clear seams, strong seams, polished as professional as purchasing one. I'll see you in half an hour. Thank you. I'm back. It's been about half an hour. Dry enough. Take off everything. Take off my weights. These bars I won't need anymore. My bar bucket. <laughs> Take off my weights. Metal weights. I take the jigs out, but I'm going to need them again, so I just keep them nearby. I'm going to need them to uh, do the other side. It's actually easier because everything's in place. Okay. What I do is I slide this back a little. As I told you, usually I would slide the back under it and then put that in. But in this case, I had already glued the support bar onto the back. And it's dry enough. Voila. I take it, slide it under anyway. I can lift this up, turn it, and place it over it. I try to get everything pretty much where it goes. You know, the bottom equal here. Remember, this is the front the back, and this here is the bottom. So what I do is I start putting the jigs in. 
I add my clamp, get my other jig in. Now, in your case, if you don't have the same type of jigs, you may just have to use a square. You might want to consider building these jigs. I mean, all they are is literally a five-sided box. Yes, I know I indented the sides in a little so I have a place for a clamp, but that's it. It's not any more complex, okay? Uh, we'll see about a sheet on doing that, as a matter of fact. Details of building a jig. Now, I make sure it's flush on both sides. It's very important. Now, remember, we do not put the weights on until after we glue. That's number one rule. Number two, we use needles only on the outside. I don't use them on the inside. And it's important to make sure everything's flush. Now, one little note here. If these baffles, or even the sides, but especially the baffles, were cut out of square, you may have trouble getting it even on the bottom here. And then that's a whole other issue. So it almost goes without saying, but when the cutting is done, whether it's you, someone else, make sure it's square. If you buy a kit from us, you know, it's sent to you, the pieces are square, it's cut on some serious equipment, and it's jointed. And that's one little advantage too, that you're going to get square pieces. Okay, let's get into some detail here. Okay, I'm back. Nothing has been done. This is exactly the way we left it. Whatever issues we come up with, it come the same issues you'll come up with. You know, we'll show you how to fix them. Main, most issues come because the table's not flat, or the pieces aren't cut square. In this case, I know they were cut square, so we won't get those issues. But the first thing we do is double check our corners. Is it flush here? Is it flush here? Let's go over to this side first. This is where we're going to start. We do the exact same things that we all normally do. We push in, make sure the space here is equal. As I said, it looks to me about 3 16 of an inch. This has to be flush. We add our two needles. Now, I don't know if I want to call an exception to the rule, but when you use needles, once the needles are in, you can add the weight even though you haven't glued. Reason is, is the needles are keeping it up. I do that so it's less apt to slide. I double check the flushness again. I cannot keep reminding you that. Because you know how many filters I've ruined in the last 23 years because I glue it, walk away, and forget to keep checking and it slides a little. I don't want that to happen to you. The needles are in. I have my little shim because sometimes you need to shove it here in the middle. Vacuum, I'm blowing excess air out. Let's begin. We start an inch away from the corner. Let's start to flow. Slowly going. If you notice it's not flowing good in the middle, like you're adding too much solvent, you might need to shim. You can, you know, at putting it in an eighth of an inch won't hurt. At this point, check it for flushness. Now, with these kind of jigs, I can actually go put new needles in on this side right now while this is still soaking because everything's locked in tight. Chances are if you're not using these jigs, you can't take that chance. You need to glue this, wait 10 minutes, come over here, put your little square in, make sure it's right, etc. It can come out just as good. It'll just take a little longer. Okay, so I'm going to add the two needles here just so I don't have to sit here and stare blankly in the space while I'm waiting about a minute, minute and a half. I'm adding my two needles. Be gentle. Remember, you can easily slide that over there. Add my bricks. Now, I, since I've done this a hundred times, excuse me, a thousand times, I'm going to add my glue right now. I blow it out about an inch away. It's flowing nice. Don't really need a shim. Although as I said, it doesn't hurt to get a little one in the middle. 
check. So he's flush. By now this should be about ready. Let's go back over here. I hold this so it won't slide too much and I pull my two needles. See how it's sunk in? See how you have glue around both sides? I call it a fillet. It slid a little. See how I pushed it right to where I need it. Flush, 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 flush. Nice fillet on both sides. The reason you want a nice fillet is because as it dries, it contracts and it will pull the fillet in instead of air. If it pulls air in, you'll end up with bubbles. That's why that fillet is so important. It's flush. Let's go to the other side. We're just about ready to pull those needles. I give this another 10 seconds. Check the flushness again. See? Yeah, it slid a little bit. I moved that. I'm going back here and checking the flushness here. Good. Let's go back. <laughs> we can pull the needles now. I gently pull one. Gently pull the other. Got a fillet. Check for flushness. Very nice. That's flush. That's flush. Okay, before we glue the baffles in, I like to give it three, four, five minutes so that as I'm messing with the baffles, I don't accidentally move my sides, even though I could do it right away if I'm careful. So let's take a break from the detail for a moment. Okay, while we're waiting for the sides to dry, just a few minutes, I want to explain to you a couple of issues or problems that might arise at this point. A couple of issues that happen is, number one, if these baffles are square, it can happen, and they won't be even on the bottom. The other thing that could happen is you might find it a little loose. These baffles don't seem loose. Too bad. You see this seems a little loose? You might say, well, you didn't cut it to the exact width. It's not true. The table could have a slight dip right there. We usually work around this by using the shims. Okay, we have plenty of shims here. As I said, you just get yourself some Formica, strip it, or what I used to use and I like using is real stiff, thin cardboard, real thin, and I cut a, a rectangle and then I fold it in half. So it, in essence, it's a thin triangle. But you might have to add a little shim here and there. Okay. I'm going to, you know, do that in a minute, and whatever issues I come about, you'll see them as I go, but just about everything can be corrected one way or another, and I'm going to show you what's most important. Like the other side, what's most important, again, is that these four corners are flush. That's flush, that's flush, and the two baffles that are supposed to be in the bottom are on the bottom. As I said, if they're slightly in, we can live with that, but they can't be protruding out. Let's get some detail now. Hello! <laughs> How you doing? The first thing I'm going to do here is get in this baffle here on the input chamber because there's two of them. Because this is small, it moves back and forth. And what I usually do is I reach my arm around, make sure it's even, and then I add the clock. Excuse me. I add it and then I double check. I also check if there's looseness. If there is, I add a shim here and here. Sometimes I push them through until it's a little tight. This is without brick. The other thing I do is if it's loose where it's moving like this, I put the bricks on first to see if it will tighten in the space up a little bit. In this case, you didn't. It was perfect. Both of these are perfect. So in this case, since it's not loose, it's flush here, I'm going to glue these two baffles, then I'm going to add weight. I take my glue, vacuum it, carefully add glue under here, no needle this time, and here. And then I add some weight. One big one here will suffice, that's a 10 pound brick. Now let's go to this side. This one's pretty tight. Let's add a clamp or two, just to get it to stay there in place. 
I don't even need one on that side. And let's check this. A little looseness there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a weight now to see if I can take up some of that looseness from a saggy tape. Voila. It's tight now. You didn't have to add shims. Try to avoid the shims because unless you're extremely experienced, it can cause other issues. You shim too much here, it might raise over here. So try to always do it by weight. Okay, and in this case, you're tightening it up a little. So you put the weight first. I check here, it's beautiful, it's even. The reason it's even, without me messing with it or pushing on it, is because I cut the pieces square. <laughs> now, I like to then check, make sure it's square. Remember the spacing here? See how it's a little gap? I push it in. Now the gap's even, see that? Up here and up here. I check here again, it's important. It's hard to get in here, but what I can do is I let it run down. It will run, look at that. It runs all the way down. I don't even have to go there to glue it. I let it run down here, stop. Then what do I do? I double check here and it's perfect. All my baffles are glued and perfect. This worked out well. And the reason it worked out well, because the pieces were cut square. If they weren't, you'll have trouble. You have to add shims, you have to pull back on it. There are times that you're just gonna have to glue it anyway and take a file to the edge. And I hope you don't have to go through that. But generally it works out fine. The two sides and the baffles are glued. Here, come on up, look. The next step is to glue the bottom on. We need to give this about 30 minutes because we're going to be manhandling this thing and setting it on the bottom. So I'm going to take 30 minutes off and contemplate my existence and I'll be back to show you how to put the bottom on. And what we're going to do is let it sit overnight and tomorrow we're going to show you how to trim flush route and polish this out of a bedroom. See you in a little while. I'm back. It's been about 30 minutes. It's dry enough to put the bottom on. First step, which is pretty obvious, is to take the bricks off, whatever you use for weight. Don't put them too far. You're going to use quite a few of them when you put the bottom on. The beauty of the weights is the cardboard, it sinks it in. We're going to take the jigs off, if you have these kind of jigs. And we don't need them anymore, not for the bottom. So we put them away. You don't need clamps anymore. Put them in the jigs. Away. Get ready a bunch of shims. Get the shims out. Very good. First step is we have to strip a piece of the paper on the bottom. Remember, we can't glue with the paper and it'll stick the paper to it. But we don't want to rip all the film off because we still got to route it. So what I do, I get a nice sharp scissors or a knife. And this is pretty self-explanatory, but you just peel it back an inch. I'm sure you can figure out how to do that. If you have paper, it's a little more Remember, if you buy very old plastic, the paper might be difficult to peel. So yeah, just peel about an inch. And what you'll have to use is like a heat gun. What it does is the glue underneath the paper has dried. And the heat gun softens it up so the paper will peel. Now this is film. I buy my acrylic usually with film and it peels off very simply. Okay, now let me uh, cut this other side off and uh, get this prepared. I'm cutting here and now I got this prepared. Let's take a little break for a moment while I clean this real well. Okay.
Okay, well, I cleaned a little of this and then I actually got a phone call. But I wanted this to be very realistic, so you might be building a filter and you might get a phone call. What I did here is I want to make sure all the edges are clean. So instead of covering this in spray, I sprayed it on the paper towel first. This is the time when you double check, make sure all four corners are flush and also where your baffles meet, four points. This is on a refusion. Obviously, back to what we were saying, if you don't have the baffles, it's only the four corners you have to worry about, okay? Now, we made sure this was clean. Next step is to get your bottom, which you know, you can look at your cut list and then the booklet, but I always cut my bottoms about a quarter inch bigger on each dimension. And that gives about an eighth inch overhang. You know, if you do a quarter inch total this way, you get eighth, eighth, quarter inch that way, eighth and eighth. And that is, number one, it's easier to glue. Because you don't worry about the glue spilling way over. And number two, it gives you a little area to trim flush route which we'll go over later. You know, if you tried to glue this right to the edge of the acrylic, besides getting a good seam would be very difficult, it would be next to impossible to get it exactly to the edge. That's why we leave a little overhang and we use a special router bit, which I'll go over when we route, to take the extra edge off. It's called trim flush routing. Now, as you should know by now, I cleaned this thoroughly, peeled one side because we don't want to scratch the bottom. I slide it underneath, and I just flip it on it to the bottom. It centers on the bottom with a little overhang all the way around, about eighth of an inch as I had said. Okay. Now let's go to some details. Flip. Okay, get a little more detail in here. What we're gonna do is we have to insert needles. And then we put the weights on. Don't try to put weights on top here and try to get those needles underneath. Difficult. For something like this, I tend to use about eight needles. And you can even use 10. General rule for needles are about every six inches or so. What I do, I have eight needles here. I put one in the end in the middle, one in the end in the other middle. And what I'm gonna do is put three on this side and three on this side. So I put one here and I put another on the opposite. I do the same thing on the other side, and the same thing here. Remember, I'm only inserting these needles about a quarter inch, they're barely coming out the other side. And then I put a needle in the middle, and feel free to put two in the middle, like one here, one here, but generally my tables are pretty straight and I don't need to. Now, you don't have to put the needle on the outside. If I have trouble reaching, you can put it in on the inside. Okay. So, as a recap, we have a needle on all four corners, one on each side, and one in the middle. That's eight. This is when I add the bricks. Remember, you can add bricks before gluing if you're using needles. And obviously, we want the bottom seam very strong. We don't want to leak, you know, so you definitely want to use needles. First thing I do is I put a brick on every corner. You know, I like to put about 15 pounds on each side, something like this. So these are 5 pounds a piece, actually about 20 pounds. And then I use a big brick on this side and I use a big one on this side. So it's actually 20 pounds, it's about 40 pounds. That kind of weight on this cardboard will sink it into the cardboard enough where you probably won't need too much shimming. Avoid using these. You probably can. If your table's pretty straight, you have cardboard and you got about 40 pounds of weight on here you don't need to that's why these bricks work good now 
The way we can tell if you need shimming or not is how these needles are right now. You want to give a slight tug to the needle. You don't want to rip it out, but a slight tug to make sure it's not loose. If it's tight, you don't need shimming. You check every needle. This one here is a little loose. This one here is a little loose. You know, they're in the middle. That means the table's sagging a little bit. But all the corners and sides are tight. So we're going to add a little shim to the middle. Watch real close. I slide it in just a little bit. Now, there's a good chance that you might need a shim here and here also. But if you do it now, your glue won't flow in. If you're not experienced, you might want to use a needle here and here. Go to 12 needles, and then you could put the shim in. But I don't tend to need that. Now I'm going to add a shim here until the needle's tight. Now the needle is tight. Double check everything. If you put the shims in too much, you could loosen needles here. So now I'm checking all the needles again. You do not apply glue until all needles are tight. Very important. If a needle is loose, that means the gap is so big that you're just going to blow glue under it. Matter of fact, when it dries, you can end up with a bubble there. So it's important that the needles are tight. Double check. Also make sure it's, there's an overhang all the way around. Make sure your weights are in place. And then make sure your needles are tight again. At this point, you can stand there and go, I am ready to glue the bottom on. Make sure you have enough glue in your bottle. If the bottle's almost empty and you have to stop to glue in the middle, you know, now you have a chance of it. The what you glued initially is drying too long. So, I also keep track of where I glue because where I start gluing, that's where I first pull the needles. I usually start in the spot that's hardest for me to reach which in this case is all the way in the corner here. Now in this case I can come to the other side of the table but let's watch it glue. I vacuumed it and now I'm slowly adding glue to that corner. I'm slowly going. If you see any place that is not filling in completely use your fingers. See watch I can go like this. You generally don't have to do that though with needles. Okay. Now we come up to the side. Then I go to the other side. And over here. This is the same way. Now I'm going to do the front, which you probably won't see me do because of where the camera is, but it's the same thing as on the back side. I follow carefully. Now when I have it glued all the way around, I go inside and I cover glue into the baffles. You know the two baffles that are touching the bottom? Got to make sure they're glued. You do the same thing. You follow it all the way down. Remember, even though there's not needles there, it's above. Voila. I look carefully, make sure I didn't miss any spots. Now, you're looking at about a minute and a half. I took about a minute to do that, so another 30 seconds, 20 seconds, I can start pulling needles. I start pulling where I started. That way, if I pull the needles in the same order that I glued, obviously the distance for it to dry for that area is approximately the same. The only other thing you'll note is when you pull the needles, if any area seems to have a gappy, and you get a feel for that, don't even worry about it right now, you can always add shims. Let's watch now as we pull the needles here, this is about ready. The first needle I pull, I see if it's too wet or good. Let's pull this. There, look carefully. See the fillet right there? That's good. So now I want to pull them in the order. I will pull the middle needle next. And then this end needle. See, it's still flaying good. Now the side. Now this side. And now you won't be able to see it, but I'm going to pull the three front needles. 
Okay. This is the time when it should be, you take a look all the way around and make sure. Now when, if I see too much extruding out, I'll sometimes add a little bit. It's not necessary. I just do it to, you know, if too much filet comes in, I like smoothing it out. Okay. Double check. Make sure that the whole unit didn't slide off. Make sure there's a lip all the way around. Come take a look real close at the seam. Make sure there's no bubbles in the seam. That is clear. Okay, make sure you didn't miss any spots. Okay, enough with the detail. Okay, there you have it. Your first masterpiece. Not too difficult, is it? I hope I was very thorough in the way I explained. I recommend that you read through the book, then watch the video, look through the book again, watch the video again. But you'd be surprised if after going through both and then go back to the video, you might clarify a few things. I am available to email, and I will help as much as I can. I'm, I'm there for you. I really want you to learn how to do this. Uh, I've been doing it for 23 years, so what I am saying to you is it is possible to build a professional quality unit in your back bedroom. I just did it. Uh, tomorrow when we route and polish this, we're going to get some close-ups on the seams. I'm going to actually peel the paper and get some extreme close-ups. And you're going to see that all the seams are crystal clear, okay, and polished. And uh, you fill this bad boy with water, it'll be a good function and filter. Okay, so any other questions or anything I missed, let me know. Uh, and also be sure to check out the... Uh, the video part with the questions and answers. Hopefully that would answer any questions that you have. Check out some of the supplementation that we're going to have in there on how to build jigs if you want to use a jig like we do. But remember, we have the kits. If you're just building one, it's a lot less expensive for you to order a kit where it's all, you know, we're able to ship it flat, inexpensive, no breakage, and you get the little squares, you know, and they work for one. Okay? Thank you very much, and I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for uh, listening to me.